Thanks everyone to come, for coming, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm Tom Sedell. I work on the comic Gunner Creek Court, which we're going to talk about today. And working on a comic is pretty solitary. You know, you work in a dark room for a few days on your own, and then every once in a while you resurface and see what people are saying about you. So I kind of relish the opportunity to talk about the comic when, whenever I can. Um, even when I was coming over to the, to the US this time, I was pulled over for special question time by the US border guards. And they were kind of interested in how I was supposed to be supporting myself here in, the, in New York. And so I was able to sit down and tell them about my comic. Um, and now that I have a captive audience, you're going to get the same talk, I guess. <laughs> and this talk is going to be roughly a two-part talk. The first part <clears throat> is just going to be about who I am and how I started the comic. And it's a small intro into the comic. But I didn't want this talk itself to be a primer into the story, because I didn't want it to be sort of the kind of talk where you had previous knowledge of the, of the story, and I didn't want it to be for people who were completely unfamiliar with the story. Um, so my background is not comics. So I can only really give my perspective on, on comics and stuff. And there's more, if you wanted a more academic view of comics, there's probably better people to talk about them than I am. And um, so I'll keep that bit fairly short. Uh, the second part of the comic is what I wanted to focus on. Um, there are certain aspects of the comic that I wanted to talk about, in particular, a relationship between two of the characters. And people who are familiar with the comic will know which two they are. Um, so it might be a little bit spoilery, but rest assured there's a lot more going on in the story. And this is just one very focused look at some of the things going on. And anybody who is new to the story, I hope it interests them to go and find up some more. And as James said, keep in mind any questions you might have. And then at the end, I'll hopefully get to those. So. I am Tom. I'm from Birmingham in the UK. And comics always interested me, but when I was younger, there was not much of a comic scene in the UK. It was very, um, you had the choice between Beano and Dandy, which was sort of old World War II layover comics for kids. And then you had 2000 AD, and that's it. You know. So there, I didn't find much there once I grew out of the, the children's comics. But eventually, when Japanese comics started being imported, um, first into Europe and then into the UK, I, I got this love of comics and realized that they could be for anybody, not just for you know, adults or for kids, but for anybody, really. And so I was very interested in the medium of comics. And I love writing and stuff, so I, I wanted to work on my own comics. But the problem was I absolutely sucked at drawing. I was really, really terrible at it. And I hated art in school. And um, I just didn't think it was a future for me, so much to the uh, relief of my parents, I went into computing instead. As you can see, I'm, I've got a certain way with computers. So I got my degree in computer science. Um, and during that time, I, I enjoyed it, but I didn't want it to be my full career. Um, coding itself is, is creative in a way, but it was missing the art, uh, artistic element that I really, I really wanted to get myself into. So, so after that, after I got the degree, I went into 3D animation. And then they helped me get a job in a small video game company. And during that time, I was able to work on my artwork at home, you know, sort of just by myself, self-taught. And after a while, I wanted to start a comic. So I set myself some, some guidelines just to stick to, to try and you know, box myself in and, and have a project to work on. And so some of the limitations I set for myself was I wanted to be able to work on it two or three times a week. I needed to put it online without fail, because I felt that an update schedule was really important. And it was going to be drawn very simply. It was going to have very flat colors, and hopefully you know, improve as the comic went on. Not quite as simple as this picture, um, but with scope for improvement as it went on. And as for the layout, nothing fancy, just a tried and true formula. I wasn't really a fan of the infinite canvas concept of comics, where the whole computer screen is your canvas, and you, know, you can do unlimited things with it. I wanted something that potentially could be printed in the future, but was not really my end goal. So um, I, w I also wanted to not alienate any particular readers. So when I wrote the story, I decided that I didn't want to focus on or rely on things like violence and sex and gore and swearing, that sort of thing, uh, but not write it in such a way that it was just for kids. I wanted everybody to read it. So, And above all, I wanted it to be written to my own interests. And that's one of the things I learned at university was if you're designing software, 
if you design it for yourself, you have at least one happy user. And so that's how I wrote the comics. You know, as long as I'm enjoying it, then I'm, I'm happy to, to keep working on it. And so with that in mind, what I came up with was going to create court. And the court itself is a large industrial complex that is somewhere in the UK. It stretches off into the horizon. It's impossibly huge. And it's so big that even though there's many people that live there, uh, it seems very empty, very solitary, very run down. And the story is about two girls that live and go to school there. And they share the court with their families and um, their classmates, and also a bunch of mythical creatures and monsters and robots. And across from the court, over a big, a big ravine, there is a forest which is similarly huge and winding and is full with creatures from mythology that I was interested in writing in. And the reason why I did this was because I couldn't decide if I wanted to do a science fiction or um, a fantasy story, so I did both. And I put them against each other. I separated them out physically, and then I made them really mad with each other. And that sort of sets the background to the story, where the, the technological side of the court is kind of at loggerheads with the mystical side of the forest. And that relationship is kind of exemplified with the main characters. The first character is Annie. She, um, she comes to the court uh, very at the beginning of the story. She's the one who we see most of the story for uh, through her eyes. And when she arrives at the court just after losing her mother and her father disappears. And she's not particularly bothered by all the strange stuff that happens in the court or the, the, the monsters and the scary stuff that happens. And it turns out as the story goes on that she st starts to foster supernatural powers herself. And on the other hand, her friend, Kat, she lived her whole life in the court. Um, and, but she's completely bewildered by the stuff that Annie introduces her to. She's very mechanically minded. She's an amateur roboticist, you know, and she likes regular kid stuff like uh, comics and TV, you know, video games, that kind of thing, and robots. And so in these two characters, they're very opposite to each other, just like the court and the forest. But in their, in, in their relationship, their oppositeness is complementary. And it's the differences between the two of them that draws them together and allows them to be much closer friends um, and allows them to work together in ways that alone neither one of them would have been able to, to do on their, on their own. So in this story, you have plenty of other relationships and, and characters like lonely ghosts, uh, strange girls who can uh, distort reality. You've got shadows and robots who turn out to be friends. You have classmates with their hidden romances. And a, a large part of the story, I wanted there to be a feeling of the fact that the teachers and the parents of the children were also fully fleshed out characters. They have their own backgrounds. This is a photo of a lot of their parents when they're younger in the story. And I wanted them to be not just parental figures and not just teacher characters. I wanted them to feel like fully rounded elements of the story themselves. And you also get this guy. This is Coyote, the trickster god who lives in the forest. And uh, he causes a lot of trouble for the court and the main character. And he's basically a jerk. So, but he's not the one I wanted to focus on. The relationship I wanted to focus on is Annie and one of Coyote's minions, I guess, Isangrin, this wolf guy here. So this is kind of an illustration of the sort of thing you'd see in the story. Um, like, like I said before, just a very focused look at a, an arc that I particularly enjoyed and I wanted to explore in a way that I found interesting to myself. And so when I do get the chance to talk to people about my comic, I like to ask people who their favorite is, um, you know, just to get some feedback and see what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong. And in stories, not a lot of people like the main character, not because they're bad, but because the main character is usually the viewer stand in, you know, the every man that they can, you can identify yourself with. Um, so a lot of people tend to pick the more visually, um, you know, striking characters and more interesting ones. But personally, I really enjoy the main characters in stories. So I wanted the main character of my story to also be personally interesting to myself. So even though I'm very interested in the two main characters, my personal favorite is Annie. And she kind of has to be because I'm, she's the, the character that I write the most. And I have to know all about her. And she has to be personal, personally interesting to me to, to continue writing her. And I, I, I enjoy you know, revealing parts of her personality to the readers as the story goes on. Um, and so when she's first introduced, 
she's very cold and stoic, and she has trouble talking to people. And this is because of her past in the hospital where she grew up. Um, but after her mom died in the hospital and she came to the court, she just seemed very not able to interact with anyone. And she's very solitary and not really scared by anything. And this is due to the experiences she's had um, in, the, in the hospital. And I wanted her to be a not just a reactive character who is bewildered and amazed by the stuff that happens around her. I wanted her to be very active in the, in the plot of the story. And sometimes the bad decisions she makes and the, the, her experiences she had really drives the plot forward. Um, because she does make a lot of bad decisions throughout the course of the story. And the other guy is this, Isengrin. When he's first introduced, he is a brute. He is a minion to the god Coyote, who, who uh, is tough to compete with in terms of you know, um, flair and, and excitement. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, um, so when you, when you look at a Sengren, he is just basically a wolf's head, an angry wolf's head, on top of a weird tree body that allows him to walk really tall and, and tower above everyone. And he very, seems very angry and out of control. And he seems very proud. But as the story continues, you find out that the pride that he holds is not for himself. It's for a coyote that he's completely devoted to. And, and he's very dismissive of Annie. He doesn't like humans at all, let alone having to deal with a young girl that he's like sort of thrust into this partnership with against his will. And so uh, at this point, I wanted to talk about the first of two little um, arcs in the story um, that kind of exemplifies their relationship and how that changes. So this first part, Asengrin is fishing alone in the forest. He's using his strange you know, tree root body to spear fish. And we see him shed his body um, and to, to come and eat the fish. And we see that underneath this strange exterior, he's uh, an emaciated very frail looking you know, wolf that can barely stand up. And this is something we've not seen at this point in the story. And he, can't, he can barely stand to eat this fish. And, and it's kind of a pathetic scene, really. It's very private, and he's alone. Unfortunately for him, um, Coyote has brought Annie along, and they're watching him from the bushes. And because Coyote is who he is, pushes Annie out in front of him, which completely incenses the Sangren. Um, he's very angry to, be, to have been found in this vulnerable state. And Annie has no idea what to do. She makes a very poor decision here, where she tries to help him up, which is the exact opposite thing that you should do. Um, so he gets her to back off as he slinks to his tree body. And he gets to beef himself back up again and be strong and then face off against her. And, and, and of course, Annie's very scared here, but she is standing her ground. And just before anything else can get any further, Old Coyote comes along and diffuses the situation and then takes Annie off on a mystical journey, little uh, interlude. And the, these pages are sort of uh, what you would find in the story, but I've taken all the words off because it's not important that you read along what's going on here. It's just that they've gone off and, and uh, gone on this magical journey. And if you're interested, you can read more about it at gunnercrig.com. Um, but since that's not the focus, I want to go back to just after that scene happens where Annie, it's time for Annie to go home. And Sengren is made to carry her back on his arm. And while he does that, as they're traveling back, I left the words here. Annie does take the, she takes the opportunity to try and apologize to him. And he says that to never apologize for what is not your fault. Because he realizes that as soon as he saw Coyote, he knew that Annie was tricked into that situation. So he doesn't hold any malice towards her. And this is the first time that Annie and the readers see that He's not really a hateful creature. He was just put in a bad situation, and he's not holding it against, the, against Annie. And so later on in the story, um, Annie gets some very bad news, and she's distraught. And she actually runs away from the court in a fit of anger and desperation. And this is a new side we're starting to see of, of Annie, who at this point has been very, very distant and emotionless. We see that she's actually very filled with an anger inside her that she has trouble controlling, and which leads her to run away. And that's where this scene comes from here. She runs into the court, instinctively runs towards a Sengren, somebody she's had a, you couldn't even call it a professional relationship with at best. You know, They tolerate each other, or at least he tolerates her, barely. But he runs into the forest, and he picks her up and carries her into the forest. 
and he tells her that he is disappointed in her because she's weak and this makes her angry but the truth is that she is weak because everybody starts off as weak and the point that he's making is she might feel weak now but what she's just gone through has made her a bit stronger and all she can do is continue to take these experiences and make herself stronger and then this allows her to spend the summer in the forest and over the time they're able to become closer and the relationship changes a bit. She's a lot freer and she's a lot more comfortable in herself and she realizes that the Sanguine, despite his outward appearances is not just an angry wolf and she takes the opportunity to become closer to him. So the second part I wanted to illustrate is after this, after she's returned to the court she is tasked with learning about the inner workings of the forest. And so in this scene here, Annie is learning about the creatures of the forest. A Sengren wants to teach her and, and help guide her. So they come to this very dark area of the forest that she's never been to. And it's full of big, horrible, scary creatures, kind of like a Sengren. They're very aggressive and they're very dismissive of Annie. Um, these are inhabitants of the forest that Annie has not had any experience with. And because of their nature, um, a fight breaks out. And Annie can do nothing but just roll out of the way. And l luckily for her, this is, you know, a Sengren's uh, bread and butter. So he gets to work laying down the law because he is in charge of these creatures, essentially, which is why he brought her here. But Annie, she can do nothing. All she can do is sit back and watch and be distraught. And at this point, it's actually Coyote who comes to her and pulls her aside in private and gives her some advice. Annie doesn't know what to do or how to help, so Coyote says, well, start speaking their language. And when she comes back and sees that the Sengren is being overwhelmed, Annie does what any sane person would do and sets him on fire. Because one of the things we learn about Annie is that she can control this fire that is inside her, and she can decide what it does and does not burn. So she, she projects the fire around the Sengren to protect him, and she projects it around herself as well, and she stands her ground. Even when the creatures come up to her, she doesn't attack them, but she doesn't allow herself to be attacked. All she does is stand there and make it clear that if they get closer to her, they will just be harming themselves. And so she makes this display of strength. Uh, she doesn't insult the creatures. She doesn't try to make them feel small or stupid. She just stands her ground and even lets them know that she's there uh, um, for diplomatic reasons. You know, she's there. If they need to talk to her, then she's there. And these creatures, they are at least smart enough to understand that they can't really mess with her. And so in their world, their understanding lets them know that they shouldn't mess with her, so they slink away. And after this, the Sengren is very happy. This is like the only time you see him like this. He's tossing her up into the air. He's calling her beautiful, which people don't really say to Annie at all. It's not the kind of thing you'd say sh you know, shamelessly like a Sengren would, but he's a wolf, it doesn't matter to him. He's just ecstatic at the strength that she showed and, and how she comported herself. And so after that, the two of them have gone through an ordeal together, uh, not just in this particular uh, instance, but in their lives. They both had very tough life, very solitary lives, and they find a, a unique closeness in each other that they don't find with their other friends and compatriots that they, in, that they might interact with. And he learns that the anger she might have is not in itself a bad thing. And he, she learns that to control it is probably what is the path to maintaining her own feelings. And as Engren also, he becomes a lot more comfortable with Annie. You can see here that he's shed his body and he is laying next to her as she tends to his, as, to his wounds. And just him doing that is a big compliment to Annie. They don't acknowledge it, or he doesn't change his behavior at all. Um, but you can see that compared to how they were at the beginning, just the fact that they're together like this shows that their relationship has changed a lot. And so their relationship continues to evolve uh, throughout the story. Uh, more stuff happens in the comic, but that's where this illustration ends. Um, and they continue to change because there's a lot more to Annie that's going that's going on and, and, and evolves. Um, but with the, the reason why I wanted to explore this 
why I wrote it and why I wanted to talk about it today is because um, it's the sort of relationship that I feel that I don't see very often in, in you know, a lot of pop culture. I think there are a couple of messages in this, in their relationship that I think runs counter to a lot of popular messages you see in stories. And those messages are, one, you should let your emotions lead your decisions. And two, accept anger, you know, don't let anger decide your decisions. You know, in fact, anything that could be classed as a negative emotion, you should either ignore or you should fix it because you're broken in some way. And I didn't want to make that sort of comment. It might be true in some uh, circumstances, but here I wanted to show that two characters can have a close relationship that is not particularly traditional. Their emotions are strong, and they're strong for each other, but they don't rule their relationship. Um, Isengrin himself, he advocates control and management. And he doesn't show a lot of these outward emotions, which I feel that is often shown as a very negative personality trait. Um, but in this instance, Annie doesn't try and change that in him. She actually comes to understand that that is how he is. Um, and she has a reverence for him that she doesn't have for a lot of the other characters. Because they can sit together in, in silence and barely talk for a long time um, and be very close. And it's very different to the sort of touchy-feely friendship she has with her other friends, like the main character, Kat, the very regular you know, relationship that two kids might have. But here, I wanted to show that not expressing these emotions, as I said, was not particularly a negative thing, because sometimes it's OK if you choose not to show your emotions, or if you feel that you can't show them. That's also fine. Because I felt that an emotion is not purely positive or negative. For example, like happiness, a pretty positive emotion. But what if it's happiness for someone's murder? You know, That's not very positive. Or let's say greed or jealousy You know, sounds bad. But what if desire forces you to work harder and buy that car that you want? You know, that's helped you out. Or hate, for example, seems pretty bad. But what if you hate your wallpaper? You change your wallpaper. What if you hate your job? If you leave that hate to fester, it will go bad. If you use that hate or dislike to motivate you to do something else, does that mean that it is now good? In my opinion, an emotion is just a thing that happens. And it's what you do with them decides whether they're good or bad. And so this is why Isengrin promotes taking an emotion like pain or a, a painful experience that you might have had and solidify it inside yourself and use that as part of the foundation on which to build your character. And he also advocates for keeping these emotions in check. And for someone like Annie, who is liable to literally spark off at any time, it's very useful for her. Um, and it's the, sort of, it's the sort of guidance that she doesn't get from other people who don't quite understand who she is. And with Isengrin, if you were to look at him in person, all you would see is a big, angry wolf guy on a tree. Um, and that's probably what he wants to show. But it takes someone to actually care for him and understand him that he is something more than that. And he's just made the decision to keep that at arm's length and keep other people that he has no time for if he decides he keeps them at arm's length. So when he does show a flare of emotion, it's a lot more powerful to whoever's there on the receiving end, as long as it's not causing any damage, I guess. And Annie realizes that she's the same way. When she joined the court, the, the reason for her stoic appearance is basically the same thing that Asengrin has done. She finds it hard to deal with the emotions that are inside her, not just because of losing her mom or being transferred to a new school or coming to terms with these powers inside her. She's just blocked them off and tried to ignore them completely, which is why she does lead to making you know, some poor decisions. And the two of them have had you know, tough times in their life. And because of this, if you were to try and be overly affectionate with a creature like a Sengren, you, you would push him away. Um, and similarly with Annie, if a Sengren was to try and teach her to try and deal with her with a light touch or with kid gloves, she would lose respect for him. And I think it's this, um, it's this that draws them together. And that's not to say that Isengrin is right about everything. In the story, a lot of the characters question his advice and his sanity. Um, and Annie does get a lot of support from the other, other characters, too. But it's very different to the kind of support that she and Annie get, uh, that she gets from Isengrin. So 
Sengren's advice is really from his point of view, from his experiences. And when I was writing these characters, I like to sort of put myself in, in their shoes and, and figure out how they would re respond to certain situations. And I think um, any decent writer would be able to write characters that are very different to themselves. Um, but in this, in this case, in fact, throughout a lot of the story, I find that um, a lot of the scenes and scenarios that I'm writing and ex exploring are parts of myself that I wanted to explore and, and illustrate in the story. And in fact, throughout the whole story, there's you know, certain um, elements of my life, like places where I used to go to school, hints of teachers that, w that I used to like back in school, friends that, I'm not, that, that I don't see anymore, stuff that's personal to me that only I would notice. And I think the readers appreciate that because they feel that it's a lot more genuine. And what this means is that I hear a lot of good feedback from the readers because they start to empathize with a lot of the situations. And they realize that I'm kind of doing the same thing. I'm exploring you know, parts of, of myself. And I think this works because people like to see themselves in stories. Um, it lets them know that they're not the only person going through a certain situation. It's easy to assume that as a person, you're the center of your own universe. And everything else is outward from that. Everything else is just something that you're experiencing for the first time. And it's easy to assume that you're the first person ever in history to feel an emotion. And I think people gravitate towards stories that show them that they're not alone in that sort of thing. Um, because in reality, nobody knows what they're doing. Um, and we sort of look for people who say that they know what they're doing. They, they look for situations that they can empathize with because, I don't know, I guess it just makes you feel a bit more understood, even if you're just passively reading something. So I think this is an underlying sort of common thread throughout everyone. Like personally, I'm not a pink haired fire girl. And I'm not an emaciated talking wolf that uses a magical tree as a body. But I can still empathize with these characters. And I think a well written character, people can emphasize, empathize with despite looking nothing like them or having very similar experiences. Um, a lot of the times, just involving similar feelings that somebody might have experienced in their life is enough to draw a reader into enjoying a character. And that is what a lot of the story is about. And there's a lot of different parts of, of me in the story, um, but I try and take those elements and make them interesting in their own right. And whether it is I create a character out of a certain experience or a particular facet of, you know, of my own personality. I try and make it interesting rather than make it into a lecture, which is what this is. But people seem to like it. Um, and from those small beginnings where I decided to work on the comic in my own spare time, it's um, updated three times a week. I've had lots of support. The books were, I mean, it was actually picked up by a publisher and the books are now available in comic stores, um, bookstores, and the sixth one is coming out soon. And I've been lucky in that people have enjoyed it so much that they wanted to support me working on the story. And they're interested in seeing what happens next. And it allows me to do things like come and talk here about it. So thanks for listening. If you have any questions about anything that you've heard or anything uh, related to it, just, just speak now. Yep. Uh, okay. So um, it's uh, reading comics, it's very clear that you plan at least certain things uh, in advance. Yep. Um, like I'm, I'm thinking about what's going on right now. But even uh, in what you showed here, like the, the two parts of that arc between Annie and Sangrin, there was like a year or two between them. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, like, how how in detail do you plan? Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. In detail, that, plan the comic. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people. How far ahead and how deep? Yeah. A lot of people are interested in knowing whether or not I know actually where the story is going or if I'm just making it up. Uh, the, the answer is that I know exactly how the story will end. I know what will happen to each of the characters along the way. But I couldn't tell you how long it will take to get to those points. I have a sort of a road map of points that I need to hit along the way uh, that will ultimately lead to the ending. So the stuff with Annie's development and the stuff with the Sangrin, that was planned in, uh, basically when I introduced the those characters. Um, but as for 
how soon I get to developing those, it's kind of malleable. You know, if I find something I'm interested in, as long as it pertains to the plot, I might take a detour and search for that. But then I'll always come back to, to the route that I've started because I kind of know what I need to hit along the way for the character developments to actually make sense. So. Um, so I have a question about like sort of the development of relationships in the story because I feel like uh, over the years you've been writing it, like the development, especially like platonic relationships, feels really natural. And hmm. I was wondering if you sort of plan out what friendships you want and sort of tweak it to fit, or if you just let the characters sort of organically see who they become friends with, like how that works. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the plot specific stuff. Um, I need to make sure there are certain characters are in certain positions, whether it's frame of mind or physically in the story. Um, so I keep track of those. But sometimes um, characters that I'll introduce that I never intended to be friends end up do being friends. You know, um, like for example, there's there's a relationship between Cat, secondary main character, and a girl called Zimmy, and for whatever reason they've sort of disliked each other from the start. And there's a very specific reason for that that I sort of wanted to introduce at the beginning. But, but then, on the other hand, Red, the fairy, um, I knew that she was going to come back, but I wasn't sure quite how their relationship would evolve and change. Um, and so when a, a character like that, if I know that I have uh, an amount of leeway to sort of change relationships that isn't going to affect the overall plot, or even better, um, lends itself to the plot, then I'll take the time to indulge in that and see what ideas come from that. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, your art style have significantly improved throughout the years. I hope so, yeah. Um, I liked it from the start, but it, was, <laughs> it changed a lot. That makes one of us. Um, so is it just from practicing three times a week, or are you actively taking courses, learning stuff online, having references? I don't know. Um, I was never formally taught. Um, so I think it is literally just spending my own time. And I think working on it three times a week, as you say, uh, is a big reason why the style that I chose at the beginning became anything at all. Um, um, when I was working a full-time job, I literally just had part of the weekend to work on it. And it took the entire weekend to get three pages up. So any practice that I was doing in visual storytelling, you know, writing comics, in fact, or just using the nuts and bolts of Photoshop and figuring out how to illustrate, that was all done in the comic. And so, you know, that's kind of, I use that as an excuse for why things look a little bit shaky at the beginning. Uh, I was hoping that things would look better as they continued, and I still feel that I have a lot of improvement, but um, I can also mask that by saying that I intended them to grow up and look different too. So uh, I can hide behind that a little bit, but, but yeah, it's literally just working on it every week. Um, were there particular manga titles that you felt really inspired you and you found yourself weaving in or, you know, somehow the elements would get worked into your into your own work? Um, I can say absolutely yes. Um, I think I would even be hard pressed to point out specifically um, where I've woven in details. But um, yeah, there are uh, the, the first comic that I really got into that showed me the comic should be more than either for adults or kids was actually Dragon Ball. I read it in Spanish because um, for whatever reason, they were imported into Europe a lot more than a lot sooner than in the UK, and I had no idea they were Japanese comics. I thought they were Spanish comics. Um, they and they looked like nothing else that I was reading. They were black and white, but they still looked amazing, you know. Um, and I, I really love black and white art and comics. And they were crass as well. Early Dragon Ball was really crass. Lots of uh, poop jokes. Um, but also, it had this evolution of character that I really fell in love with. As you read the story, the characters grew up, uh, which is very contrary to, I guess, a lot of comics in general, but a lot of the stories in the UK, like the ones I mentioned, Beano and Dandy. And even 2000 AD, the characters are stuck in this sort of time warp where they never get older. And they, you know, the world might change around them, but it's always the same characters. And I, I, mean, I guess that's fine if that's your story. But for me personally, I found that, that development in the, a lot of the long-form Japanese comics. Like, I think that was probably my biggest single influence that I wanted to maintain in this and have the characters age and grow up and develop as they go on. I'm sure there's a ton more. I bet there's you know, characters based on uh, you know, aspects that I wanted to explore and, and, uh, and things like that. But yeah, I'd have to go through and <laughs> really think about that. <laughs> 
So kind of related to the previous two questions, um, yeah. I'm wondering, like, when you started, you, did you kind of like have an idea of what sort of art style you're aiming for? It's like, oh yeah, this is like what I want to do, but I have to like, uh, but I have to like develop develop myself and like I'll, I'll get there eventually. And now you're like, oh, you know, I'm like. Yeah, no, that, that's interesting so. because I didn't have a specific idea, just um, the goal was very, it was kind of utilitarian. It was more that I needed to be able to get it done quickly and effectively, um, which is why the coloring for the characters is very flat. The coloring in the backgrounds can have a bit more depth. And the characters are drawn very simply at the beginning. And I did that. It was very different to how I drew at the time um, because I felt that I needed a way of getting the pages finished and then moving on to the next one. Because I, I didn't want to fall into the trap of um, laboring over a single page and then never updating again. So I, I knew that I had a specific goal in mind, but I had no idea what it was going to look like. Um, fairly happy with how it looks now. You know, um, and there are some differences in my artwork that I want to make and expand on, and I'm hoping that continues because I think if I feel that I've improved as much as I could, then that's when I start to stagnate. Um, so no, I had no idea what it was going to look like, but I did have just this sort of groundwork at the beginning to go off. Um, hi, I, I've been reading the comics since um, high school, and I wanted to ask about um, Cat and Paz, yeah. um, who I like really love that relationship. It like really means a lot to me and a bunch of like my other like queer women friends. Um, yeah. And I wanted to ask like how early you started like thinking about developing that relationship and getting those two characters together. Like was it like with the platonic relationships where it's kind of like intended from the start to put them in the same place at the same time, or if yeah. it like happened later on? Uh, it happened a bit more organically than some of the stories, but I knew that with Cat and Annie, I wanted to introduce the relationship where, um, well, you know, to be frank about it, I wanted to introduce a relationship where um, Kat was attracted to another girl, but it didn't cause a rift in the relationship that she had with Annie. Um, it wasn't a situation where um, they would stop being friends or that Annie would think, that for whatever reason, that they can't be friends anymore. Um, I wanted to show that their platonic relationship can be maintained while Kat, you know, grows an attraction with another classmate. And the choice to, to use Path as, as the girl that, you know, Kat eventually becomes attracted to, that was a bit more organic. I, I had the ideas of their interactions at first um, in mind. But then when I, I did, I wrote some of the scenes, I thought that they had a really good chemistry together. And um, so, I knew that, that she was going to get together with, with someone, and it was very likely to be Path. And in the end, I just chose that you know, it was going to be her. And so um, I focused on, on their relationship and showed how it was actually a, a good opportunity for me to make Path into a more rounded character. Because right at the beginning, she was just a background character like a lot of them. And in fact, if you were to look at really the first, the first chapter, the first two chapters are me sort of finding my ground. Um, that's why they're very different to the chapters you might find later on. Um, I used the first two chapters to get a feel for working on comics. And wh whereas I knew where the story was headed, I didn't quite know what the tone was. It was actually going to be more, more like a murder mystery sort of story. And, and I realized that by the time I finished the first two chapters, that that's not the theme that I wanted. So during that time, when I drew various background characters, Path was one of them. And um, I liked her enough to want to develop her character more. And I think because of the, the, uh, the format of the story, I had the freedom to do that. So yeah, uh, I think I made a good choice for a path, because she's one of my favorite ones that I wanted to expand a bit more on. <laughs> so another question. Yeah. Um, so the court is uh, highly technological and somewhat secretive uh, organization. Yep. So how much of the current like, very large techni technical corporations are you kind of like drawing on? Or is, or is this kind of more of a, some other, other influences that I could also see? But Well, I guess um, from the visual standpoint, the, the look of the court is very much based on Birmingham, where I currently live and where my family's from. Uh, Birmingham is, it was, it's the 
they call it the second city of the UK, but it's not actually the second largest. It's just during the World War II, it was the, like one of the most important. It's where a lot of the Spitfires were made, and uh, the Black Country is where a lot of you know the, the the factories were, and all those factories are still there, but no one uses them anymore. Nobody uses you know coal refineries, um, and so they're just sort of left you know as dilapidated factories around. Um, it's being changed now, but you know. Um, just like any inner city, it becomes, you know, it gets developed. But I wanted to make a lot of the interior of the court look a lot like that, just because I thought it was a nice backdrop to have everything. There, it's, I get, there's the sense of there is an era of technology in the area in Birmingham and where the girls are, the, st the, the main characters, that has moved on, you know, and it's, it's empty now. It's technology that is old and it's falling apart, and that's currently where the characters are. So it wasn't a specific. Um, inspiration from particular companies, but it was that feeling of technological progress has moved on, and what was now, no, what was high technology has now moved on. Um, and I felt that was just sort of an interesting backdrop for it. Hey, um, so I like uh, how that I like that you you know wanted to point out one of these important relationships. Um, that you're writing, and I'm curious what other there are a lot of great iconic duos, you know, throughout this comic. And I'm curious what which other one you like writing the most besides Farina, the one you talked about today, and of course Annie and Kat. Um, one that I found interesting and I had a good time working on was spoiler alert, I guess, is a relationship that's actually come to a close. It was Mort's introduction to the story. Mort is there he is in the top right. He's um, he's a little ghost. Boy, and as soon as he was introdu introduced into the story, I knew how he would exit the story um, because he had a very, uh, very closed arc. And I was able to, he was like one of the first characters introduced into the story uh, really early on. And when he was able to leave, it was like finally I can show everybody what I had in mind for this boy um, and give him a final send off. And I wanted to, I didn't dwell on it, but I did want to sort of touch on the fact that. He's a, he's a ghost that hangs around in the court, but he'll never get older. And he knew that Annie and Kat were, were going to grow up. And so he used that opportunity as well to exit the comic, or I guess the world, you know. Um, and I, I really enjoyed like writing him and drawing, especially his final chapter, where I get to show his past and show in no uncertain terms how he came to be where he is. And there's a sense of satisfaction in you know, wrapping up a long-running thread like that. But as for as for other characters, I like Jones. Uh, she's I guess she's not up there, but Jones has a lot of she has a really strange relationship with Eglamore um, that I've not really gone into very much yet, and I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, there's a lot of relationships that I want that I really look forward to exploring. You know, like Annie's dad and her mom. Um, you know, showing what happened there, and showing how things have, have ended up where they are. And Jones, uh, I like in particular because she's a common thread throughout a lot of those stories. Um, yeah, I don't know. I couldn't pick a particular favorite just because they have to be interesting to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have them in there at all. Zimmy and Gamma, for example, I love writing those two, um, and I want to write comics about them separate from the main story. Um, but in the meantime, they're in and out of the comic when the plot. You know, needs them there. Is there a large Polish population in Birmingham? Yes, there is. That was one of the inspirations for writing Gamma um, as someone who can only speak Polish. But I guess they gravitated there after, again, after World War II, there was a shortage of workers. So there was a lot of um, European um, migrants looking for work from Poland and, and I guess from Jamaica too. Um, so there's a large sort of, and middle, you know, middle European uh, population just there that I thought was interesting. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? I've yeah. got one. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I noticed that uh, in some of the more recent comics, there there's been um, essentially a moral debate happening in all of the uh, reader comments. Mm -hmm. um, so they've they've been debating, you know, did this character make the right decisions? With the information and uh, that they had, and uh, you know, did they needlessly endanger uh, other characters? Yeah. And uh, one of the things that happened immediately afterwards uh, was 
kind of a uh, kind of a quieter patch of the comic where uh, two characters actually discussed the moral implications <laughs> and sure, the decisions yeah. that they have made. Yeah. So to what degree did you sense that coming on or uh, did you see what was happening, the response you were getting from readers no. and feel that uh, it was worth an, a response in the comic itself? Yeah. Well, um, the way that I work on the comic is that I draw with a large buffer, and this was part of why I, you know, what I set up at the beginning to make sure I didn't lo miss any updates. Um, and that buffer is roughly two months' worth of comics. So if I was to keel over and die right now, you'd at least get some more comics to read for a little while. Um, but what that means is that I don't generally have the time to, if, if, if I feel that reader reaction is strong enough that I need to address it in the comic. Um, I literally just don't have the time because by the time people are reading what's happening now, I've already drawn two months ahead. So the stuff that is happening now that seems to, uh, some people are speculating, well, he's done this to address our comments. Turns out I actually wrote the scenes originally knowing that people would have these questions and now I'm addressing them. So I don't know whether, whether that makes me seem smart or lucky. Um, it just so happens that what they're talking about now is the stuff that a lot of the readers were discussing amongst themselves. And so at least I can say that, you know, I had the foresight to anticipate that people would have some questions, but it was this discussion is what I wanted to have after the particular sequence of events that you're talking about. So, yeah, I guess uh, I looked into it. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Yeah. Sorry, returning to the theme of like the progression of the artwork, um, I know that like there are a couple of webcomic artists who have eventually gone back and redrawn early panels. Yeah. Um, given like the overarching theme of like growth and the personal journey focus of your talk, like do you have a phys philosophical like disagreement with this practice? Oh uh, no, not at all. Um, if people want to do that, then all the power to them, but it's something that I am never going to do. <laughs> uh, because I've seen it happen before, but it's a very easy quagmire to get stuck in, um, where you can put your comic on hold and then go back and start essentially redrawing it from the start. Um, some people have the time to do that. There is a lot of value in that, um, especially, I think, if, if you're doing a much shorter, self-contained story. Um, and if I was doing that, maybe I'd want to go back and redraw some elements, but for me, I can look back at the beginning of the story and understand that that's all I could do at the time and be glad that I've progressed to a point where it does look different. So um, I made the active decision to not go back and redraw those, even though it's been tempting sometimes. Um, I mean, there's been one or two areas where I've had to I don't know, reformat the text because it was too close to the side of a word bubble. But that's about the extent of it. Um, yeah, I didn't want to get stuck in that trap. <laughs> yeah. came in late, so might have missed this. But how do you draw them? And thanks for coming here. Uh, thank you. How do I draw who, sorry? Just how do you draw the comics? Like, what do you use for it? OK, yeah. Um, I could spend ages talking about this, but I'll try and give you the quick version. When I started, I drew it on printer paper, you know, just A4 printer paper um, with pencil. And then I used fine liners to ink it, and then I would scan it. Um, after a while, I didn't like that process, so I switched to what I'm doing now, which is currently all digital. It's the same exact processes, but I, I just removed the step of having to you know, worry about erasing lines and destroying my paper before I can scan it. Um, so I draw it all. I sketch the pages um, according to a script that I have. I draw them currently in Photoshop. Um, and then I ink them, and I color them either entirely in Photoshop, um, or I use another program called Coral Painter. I guess all the ones that are examples here that are in the story themselves are colored in Photoshop with some brush tools that I've developed myself. When I do um, illustrations, let's see if I can find one, I do take it into a different program that handles you know, colors and colors a bit better, like this one would have been done in Painter, uh, just because it handles color a bit differently for illustrations. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's not a very specialized way of working on the comic. Um, and again, it's because I needed a, a simple way of getting it done. Um, I think in the future, I might be looking to move away from Photoshop, but still maintain a similar look. It's, but that's just, that's just because Photoshop is not really built for illustrators and 
and comic artists. It's just, it's, it was very much a tool that I had to maneuver into a position that I could to, you know, get it to do what I wanted. Yeah. All right, I think that's all the time we have. Okay, great. Let's uh, thank Tom for coming out. All right.